Hi and welcome to this episode of the Survivor Diaries. This is the first of a two-part series and it's focusing straight away on the issue of the child arrangements in private children law proceedings. My aim in this and the second video is to give you an overview of the Child Arrangements Programme and what should happen if you are making an application to the court or if you've received an application from the court as well. And with that I want to show as well an example where there has not been domestic abuse and maybe the parents just cannot agree and also an example of what to do when there has been domestic abuse between the parents as well. I'm just going to, before we start, I'm just going to disclaim a few things first. So first of all, I am giving, in a very short period of time, some very generalised advice about how to fill in the forms, how to respond, what kind of proceedings or what kind of hearings will happen as you work through the child arrangements proceedings. Nothing can be better than taking specialist legal advice by speaking to a solicitor about your own unique situation. It's the job of a solicitor to completely understand the situation and then work out how the law would apply to that situation. Obviously, if I've not discussed with a person the ins and outs of their situation, I cannot give very, very specific advice at this stage. So that's the first disclaimer. Secondly, <clears throat> I'm going to, as I have done in one of the video logs, just confirm that I am going to be talking predominantly about an abuse that continues from, usually from a male abuser towards a female. Again, I'm disclaiming that that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen the other way around. It doesn't mean that false allegations can't be made. What I'm saying is that the, the general pattern that I see tends to be a father being abusive of a mother who has the children living with her. This is because we, we're in a patriarchal society we're coming out of the patriarchal society and as people become more aware sexually that there's there's an equality between the sexual the sexes sorry this is kind of trailing on from like how people used to be and how women used to be treated in the past it does happen that a lot of the applications are from fathers and i know that there's big protests today from groups like Families Need Fathers, Fathers for Justice, about parental alienation. So I'm going to be talking in a very gender specific term. I'm following Pat Craven's model of the dominator and if I do slip into the mother being the respondent in the application or <clears throat> and receiving an application from an abusive father, that's why. So that's the next thing that I'm disclaiming. Finally, the last thing that I have to just, just clarify is that I am a solicitor in England and Wales, therefore this is what I understand the law to apply in this jurisdiction. So if you live outside of England and Wales, this may not necessarily apply to you or this may not be the method that the child arrangements work. I'm very, very quickly going through, first of all, in this episode, how a normal child arrangements application should proceed when there is not domestic abuse. I advise that if you are watching to learn how to respond or to make an application where there is domestic abuse, that you watch this video first so you can see a lot of the steps that will still be the same in both applications and you can see what would be happening if domestic abuse hadn't been alleged and you understand the different hearings. We're looking at the application, normal application, there's no abuse. The first thing that's going to happen is why are we getting to court in the first place? So we're talking about a co-parenting relationship and we're talking about two parents who cannot agree the arrangements for the child or a specific question about the child. This is not, I keep clarifying this, this is not a situation where there is abuse. If the two parents, both having parental responsibility, cannot agree on a specific question to do with a child, then they need to refer to the court and they need to ask the court to make the determination for them. The court will then make an order having heard both of the parties and their positions and the court will always consider the welfare of the child as its paramount consideration. Section 1 of the Children Act makes sure that it does that. Before we've even made an application, there is a process that is required to be considered at the very least by the courts before you can make the application, which is the process of mediation. Mediation 
is a good idea if you think that you can sit down with your partner and that you can talk things through maybe with a legal professional or mediator with you so that you can get an idea of what the court would say if you had to get that far. If you can agree in mediation you can avoid the stress, the costs and the bad feeling that these proceedings can often break, bring as well. It cannot be resolved between the parties, mediation may have been attempted, mediation may not be appropriate and I'll come to some reasons why mediation may not be appropriate in the second episode but what I will say at this stage is that domestic abuse would make it inappropriate. One of the parties is going to say, right, I need to ask the court to sort it out. And that person is the applicant making the application. The application is made on form C100. And you can find a copy of C100 if you just put it into Google. It's, it'll be the first thing that it brings up. You can also get a copy from the court building itself. Form C100 is prepared and it's sent into the court. The court will then do several things. So the first thing is a process called gatekeeping. At this stage, either a legal advisor or a judge will have a look at the application, decide if it's urgent, decide what level of judge it should be heard by, and the legal advisor or gatekeeper will then set it for a date for a hearing called a first hearing dispute resolution appointment. What the legal advisor then has to make sure that they do is inform the other party to the application who is called the respondent. They will send a copy of the application out to the respondent and they will also send a copy of the application to CAFCAS. Now CAFCAS are the Children and Families Court Advisory and Support Service. And what they have to do at this stage is just do some initial checks called safeguarding checks to make sure that there are no welfare issues immediately evident around the child because the child is the paramount consideration here. It's CAFCAS who will at this stage make a telephone appointment to speak to both of the parties. It's quite a lengthy appointment, quite often these calls can last for 30 minutes up to an hour and with the CAFCAS officer you will be going through what the issues are, what you want to happen and any problems that there have been. CAFCAS will record both of these, from, one from the applicant, one from the respondent saying what their issues are in something called a safeguarding letter or a Schedule 2 letter to the court. This process is to advise the court if there are any difficulties and to make initial recommendations or advice to the court. Another job of CAFCAS would be to check with the local authority, to check with the police on the two parents to see if there's anything in the criminal backgrounds, or anything where children's services have been involved and if children's services have been involved they may ask them to then later prepare a report because they may know the family already. Everybody's getting ready for this first hearing called the First Hearing Dispute Resolution Appointment when the parties attend, they're usually asked to attend an hour before so that they can discuss with the duty CAFCAS officer what the issues are, if those are still the issues and if they can see any way to agree the, the arrangements or the, the question before they actually go into the court. So the parties would be expected to talk with the CAFCAS officer about any possible agreement that they could make. Both parties will go into court the judge or the magistrates will hear from both parties and the judge will see if there's any agreement. If both parties can agree something, then they can make something called an order by consent. And that can be an order about where the children will live, how often they see the other parent, a specific question about the school, anything like this that's agreed. The court would be pleased to see agreement at this stage. Now I'm going to tell you what the courts are looking for between parents where there has not been domestic abuse. They are, perhaps it's an ideal, but they're looking for a perfect co-parenting relationship. And that will be difficult if people are coming out of a relationship very het up, very upset, feeling emotionally raw, and still perhaps fighting high conflict. It can still be that kind of situation. What I understand is that where there is not domestic abuse, usually those parents will be able to overcome that and say, well, okay, we're going to have to 
just do what's best for the child. Let's just be civil with each other. And they'll be able, because they are non-abusive people, to reach some kind of agreement or understanding and decide that they don't want to spend all that money on solicitors and barristers and courts and actually they just like to spend it on having holidays with children and, and good things like that. So this is a good example of co-parenting. Remember that a lot of cases don't even go to court at all because the parents can decide for themselves what the arrangements are going to be and they will keep the communication good with the other parents, they will exchange information about the child, really good examples, they will support contacts with the other, child, with the other parents, sorry. so they'll encourage, say, daily phone calls, FaceTime calls with the other parent to show that they are respectful and co-parenting equally with the other parent. So that's what the courts are looking for and they are especially looking for it because at this stage where there's no allegations of domestic abuse, there's no allegations of harm, the courts are being guided by section 2A of the Children Act. Now 2A of the Children Act says that the court may make an assumption that the involvement of both parents in a child's life will further that child's welfare. It will be good for that child. This is a section that has been inserted into the Children Act of 1989 by a different piece of law called the Children and Families Act 2014. Section 11 inserted this and said, the courts may make this assumption. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to understand if domestic abuse has not been alleged, that the courts are coming at this from some very um, straightforward presumptions. So one, they're acting in the best interests of the child. Two, they want to consider all of the different aspects about the child and they're also coming with the assumption that the involvement of both parents, both ex sets of extended family are important and good for a child to be able to know. So where it's safe and practical, they want to order contact with both parents. At this first hearing, I'm hoping that we can edit it so that a flash, a flash card comes up here. And what I'm hoping that you can see on your screen is that we've had the C100 application. This may or may not have come with a form called C1A. And for that, I want you to look at the second video. Remember, these are two 20 minute videos. So I want you to look at the second video to see the significance of that form. The application has been made. The respondent before this first hearing should acknowledge that the proceedings are going on on form C7. So they send that into the court. We all get together for this first hearing dispute resolution appointment or FUDRA. And one of the things that the court wants to look at straight away is whether or not going forward, if we can't agree the issues, is it possible that interim contact could be set up? Because remember, it's in the child's interest to know both, both parents and have a relationship with both parents. So at this first hearing, the court may order that there is interim contact based on those assumptions and based on Section 2A of the Children Act. They may consider some safeguarding, they may consider whether or not that contact needs to be supervised, supported in a contact centre, whether it should be overnight, depending on the age of the child, there'll be all kinds of things to consider at that stage. With slightly older children, they will also want to know what the wishes and feelings of the child are. You can assume for younger children that then it's about needs, it's about routines for very young children and about making sure that they have fooding, food, they have clothing and of course all of the other things that, that very young children need. The court in that case with very young children may just jump straight from the first hearing down to a final hearing and they may say okay we don't need somebody to do a report looking at what the children want to happen because they're too young. There's no safeguarding issues, so we're just going to say, let's have a contested final hearing if the parents don't agree, and both parents can put in a statement, and then they can say what they think they should, the contact should be, as in where the children should live, and how often they should have time with the other parent. So then it would become into a contested hearing, a final hearing, which would last a full day. In that hearing, that's where you'd be expected beforehand to prepare a statement 
setting out any evidence, any difficulties that you've had, and asking the court to make the order that you think is best for the children. At this final hearing, they will then make a determination of what, what the arrangements are going to be, or what the answer to the question is going to be, and they will make a final order. That's assuming that the children are very young, and it's very straightforward. If the children are a bit older, as I said, they want to know the wishes and the feelings. So what they may do is that they may also ask at this first hearing that CAFCAS come in again and that they prepare something called a Section 7 report. The Section 7 report will go through something called the Welfare Checklist, which is at Section 1, Subsection 3 of the Children Act. This looks at so far as they can be ascertained, the wishes and feelings of the child, age, needs, background. It's a long list that you can look at at section 1.3 of the Children Act if you put that into Google. And they will feed that report back to the parties and to the court. It's quite an extensive report. They'll come out, they'll see the children, they'll see the children with both the parents. They may also be involved in progressing or making contact carry on or supervising contact and recommending when it should change to a different stage. So they do quite a bit of work with the parents, with the family, for the courts, making recommendations as they go along. In the Section 7 report, they may then make a final recommendation to the court and a lot of times the court will follow the recommendation of CAFCAS. They don't have to and they can depart from that and that if you needed the court to do that, you would need to detail why that was in your statement and what you think that the CAFCAS officer may have missed. If a Section 7 report is being prepared, it would mean that the parties would be asked back to court after the report has been repaired, prepared so that they could have what's called a dispute resolution appointment. Now that CAFCAS have given their recommendations, the court wants to know what the parties think of those recommendations. Again, we're asking if agreement can be reached at this stage. If agreement can be reached, great, the court may make a final order, again by consent, showing the agreement of the parties, and then that would save the expense and the stress of a contested final hearing, which can increase the animosity, if there is animosity between the parties, it's a difficult process, both parents will end up feeling like they're on trial, because they are, and ultimately the courts will impose an order on the parents. The court is trying to get the, the parents to agree, because the court understands that an agreed order, an agreement between the parents, is much more likely to be adhered to. Whereas the imposition of an order, and all the bad feeling created, quite often can lead to that final order breaking down. Going through it again then, just summarising, you can see that in a normal application, you can see that there's three main hearings, sometimes only two, starting with the application C100, responding on form C7, sending those back to the court. The court has listed it for a first hearing dispute resolution appointment. It then may progress to a dispute resolution appointment with a section seven report and from there, if the parties are still not agreed, it may move on to a final hearing. As I've kept repeating, this is what would happen if the parents were equal, still in dispute, still in conflict about an aspect of their separation, and yet there is not abuse there. This is the normal procedure, the normal pattern of events that would happen in the course. And again, I've got to remind you, I'm giving very, very general advice. I've said already that the purpose of these videos is to help people who are experiencing the child arrangements application on their own without a solicitor. They're a litigant in person in court. So I'm setting out here the different things that you would need to do, obviously following the orders specific to your matter that you get from the court. It is very, very different, and this is the other reason why I'm making these videos, it's because I want court professionals, CAFCAS, judges, anybody working with people experiencing domestic abuse to understand that it is very, very different to a domestic abuse situation. High conflict parenting, where parents, two parents, equally not able to let go of the end of the relationship, equally affected, 
equally harmful to the children if their conflict carries on and that's a very different situation to the alternative which is where abuse is being perpetrated by one parent against the other and I think that this distinction is often missed by Kafkas and sometimes it's missed by children's services. I'm just going to tell you how children's services could come into this application. Just going back to our flowcharts, I've explained to you that Kafkas may be asked to do a Section 7 report. Kafkas will also be asked, well Kafkas will definitely do the first section here, the telephone appointment, and then it's either CAFCAS or Children's Services that would compile the Section 7 report, the report back to court that's making those recommendations. If Children's Services, if CAFCAS are involved, they need to be able to understand the difference between two parents who are not able to agree, high conflict parenting, granted there could even be parents maliciously withholding contact because they're still upset about the end of the relationship, could be arguments. This is very, very different to the domestic abuse that we're talking about. Why is that distinction important? Well, the next video, the next episode is going to show what should happen if there is domestic abuse and how those proceedings should change. It's important because domestic abuse can have an extremely damaging effect on children. Any form of domestic abuse, even just hearing one parent being spoken about badly by the other. And I know Pat Craven's dominator has the bad father, which is the obvious character aspect that we think of with child arrangements. But domestic abuse, all of these different aspects of domestic abuse can have an impact on the children. So the jailer, the jailer, just to pick another example, would prevent the mother from going out, would therefore prevent the children from being able to go out, see other people of the same age, develop socially, it all connects. So it's vital that the courts can distinguish between two parents who can't agree something and a situation where there is domestic abuse. It is not fair if it is a domestic abuse situation to label both parties as, as bad as each other, as being high conflict. It simply is not fair. In a domestic abuse situation, one parent is desperately trying to acquiesce, to bow down to the abusive personality and is being undermined and horribly corroded by this toxic person, this, this very, very different situation. So in the next 20 minute video, I'm going to look at domestic abuse and how to raise that in these proceedings that we've just looked at and how the court should deal with things differently. Okay, so I hope that's been useful. As I said, if you're watching both to understand domestic abuse and child arrangements, after watching this, please now watch the subsequent video, which is about domestic abuse in the child arrangements, how to raise it with the court and what to do next. Thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again.